we could talk about so many things today, but the main focus of today is um, the film music. And um, we talked just shortly outside that um, I'm uh, myself working as a sound designer in movies and for me your music has been inspiring in so many ways in, um, and I was thinking originally like going all the way back and trying to work through your work as a film composer a little chrono chronologically I thought it would be interesting to hear how did your own passion for film start out? Where did that come from? When did you start watching movies? You're talking about, oh, movies. Well, I think we all watched movies as kids, didn't we? But uh, I didn't uh, write my first film score until, oh, I was in my 30s. And I didn't really have plans to do very much film writing, and I've done a lot since then. Uh, uh, by the time I got started, I had my own ideas about films, and I had lots of problems with directors. Of course, you know about that. Um, and I actually uh, ended up doing the, well, let's say, the, uh, the commercial films in the way that they wanted. Which is, there's only one way that they do it. They finish the film, and then you put in the music. That's how they do it. Uh, but I... I developed alternative ways of working, which I did with film, which were, these were not the commercial films, these were the performance films that I've worked on. Things like a Dracula or Le Belle Le Bat. Um, uh, and one of the things that I, I, I resisted was the, the formulaic way of working, uh, which uh, the difficulty with that was that the, uh, uh, the composer doesn't have a chance to engage the material of the film in a complete way. And uh, I've had this discussion with a lot of filmmakers and no one seems to understand, really and truly, well, not, not, every, not no one, the two people who did, uh, the two people I work with who knew a lot about film music were Martin Scorsese and Woody Allen. Those two guys really knew something about, about it. And they left me alone, totally. They never told me what to do. That's how I knew that they knew what they were doing. <laughs> because uh, when it, it's, the trouble is when people don't know what they're doing and then they tell you what to not do, tell you what to do, you know what you shouldn't be doing it. That, that causes a lot of problems. So basically, unless you want to get fired, and sometimes you do want to get fired, the best thing to do is to get fired very quickly and get paid the, uh, what we call the kill fee, and then you can go home. <laughs> and I've, I've done that with successfully a number of times. Uh, uh, I pointed out to the filmmakers that uh, uh, I asked them to do a, a very simple experiment, which is to, something that we've all done, just to pull on the television and, uh, and change the music and watch the picture, and you'll see that the emotional point of view of the picture changes as with the music. But try it the other way, uh, try music and try changing the picture, and the music doesn't change. So that tells us uh, that, the, uh, that the, I would say, the emotional content of the film almost is entirely in the music. This is, an, uh, this is a thought that is unknown to filmmakers, and they hate this. Uh, so I don't get very far with this argument. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I began, uh, I, I've done a, n a number of pieces where uh, the film, um, in fact at one point I, 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 I did a whole series of uh, uh, short films with filmmakers and I basically I, 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 I uh, commissioned them to write, to, to work with me and I would, uh, uh, I would uh, do the music and then put the film with the music. Uh, and we performed it. It's a, it's a whole evening by itself. It's five short films. Uh, it was called Philip on Film. The, the producer is here someplace. Linda, are you here? Yeah, she's, she's the, it was her idea actually. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, uh, 
But in that film, I was able, except for uh, the only person who resisted this was Peter Greenaway. And um, what he did, and t uh, I, uh, he gave me, uh, he, I, I had some music and he gave me a film and I put it to the, and I moved it around as I wanted to. And then he took it and then he moved, then he, he recut the music. That wasn't, he wasn't supposed to do that. So I haven't worked with him since then. <laughs> uh, and I haven't worked with him before then either. So this idea of, uh, of where, the real question is, at what point does the composer get engaged with the process? And what I did is that I would go to the, I, be, I got engaged at the very beginning. I, of course I would see a scenario, a film script beforehand, uh, before it was even shot. And it, was, it wasn't that hard to figure out. It's, a lot of, uh, a film script could be maybe 100 pages, and it might be 100 minutes long. So it's about a minute a page. It didn't get very far off of that. So if you had three and a half pages that you had to score, it was about three and a half minutes. It was, it, you didn't, in fact, now, however, what I did do, which, though, though I wasn't allowed to, I had to wait till the film was being done until then I could do it. But I had my own way of working, which is that I would only watch the film once. Okay. Therefore, I would, I, I would have the normal memory lapses about what happened. And, uh, and so I was able to make a distance between, what I was trying to do was to create a natural distance between the film and the music. And that it was my uh, belief and my conviction, I should say, that the, uh, the spectator who was watching, uh, they are the ones that put the, the two things together. We don't do it, they do it. And uh, if we do it, if we, if we, uh, we don't have to do it completely, we, as we say, we don't have to put the mustache on the Mona Lisa, <laughs> or you don't have to put the bark on the dog. We don't have to do that. Uh, if you do that, you've entered the world of propaganda. You're not talking about art anymore. Uh, and that's the, what the big difference is. If you leave enough room for the spectator to uh, adjust his uh, expectations to what is actually happening, uh, it becomes a much more creative situation for everybody. But again, uh, I've been able to talk with you about this, but almost no one in Hollywood ever would even listen to this talk. Now, from time to time, when I would be out there, I would, there's a kind of a guild of comp com, um, film composers, and uh, they get together and complain to each other about what's going on, <laughs> basically. And uh, uh, one time, it was my turn to give a talk, and I gave a talk. And uh, there were about 60, 50, 60 people there. Not, not a big crowd. And, um, but they're all film composers, and I, I liked to, I, I got to know a lot of them over the time. And in this one talk, one of them said to me, he said, Phil, tell me, what is the difference between opera and film? And I thought for a moment, and I said, not much, except the workplace is different. And that's the point. The workplace has been constructed by uh, uh, producers and filmmakers. Uh, it's not an organic or sympathetic place for a composer to work in. Have you noticed that? You, do, you work on films. Yeah, exactly, and the, the creative process, that's always well, the difficult tell, part. Let everybody know what you do so that you're not hiding. No, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a sound designer for movies, but also uh, doing a lot of, um, like being a big part of the music process, because I think there's so many movies where music is an afterthought. I mean, it's not a part of the process. And I think the, f the earlier that you can be part of the process as a composer and as a sound Well, that's, person, the, that's the, the best way to do it, of course, yeah. and uh, we're not usually allowed to do that. I've only done, actually the person who let me do it was, Mark, was Scorsese. And uh, uh, I had heard he was working on a Dalai Lama movie that was Kundun. Was it? 95 or 96, something like that. Yeah. Something around that yeah. time. And uh, uh, I had heard uh, uh, Melissa Matheson was a writer. She also wrote uh, 
that one about E.T. Yeah, exactly. So she's a very well-known film uh, uh, scriptwriter. And uh, she said, uh, we both belong to an organization in New York called Tibet House, which was a um, cultural center for Tibetan refugee workers, this kind of thing. And she called me and said, uh, she's, uh, we were both on the board, so she said, Marty is making a movie about the Dalai Lama. I said, I, I have to see him. So I went to see him, and I, I knew him for a couple of other reasons, but I had met him a number of times before. And, uh, and so we talked about the film, and, and he said, uh, well, okay, well, I'll see you in a few months. I said, no, Marty, we have to start now. And he said, what, what do you mean? I said, well, what I think, what I'd like to do is, um, let's just go walking, <laughs> rolling. So he said, I'd like to, um, uh, he said, I'll, I'll, I'm going to put the music in. I'll have to do the film first. I said, no, no, no. So what I want to do is let me write the film. I'll do it reel by reel. In those days, we, used, we had six reels. Now we don't, you know, we still talk about reels, but we don't have reels anymore. But it's a way of talking about the time length of the movie. It's, it's back, just a short explanation. A reel is back in the old days where you had 35 millimeter prints and you could only have like 20 minutes on each yeah. reel. So well, during the process you talked about oh. uh, splitting it into reels. In, in fact, in Kundan, there's one mm. reel, the, 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 the fifth reel, which is the escape from, from Tibet, is 24 minutes. And he had to get uh, an extra large... Uh, a real to do it, and he did. He, he he managed to do that. And I said, no, no, I want to start now. And, he, and I said, I'm going to write the music. I have to explain what he's going to do. And um, and he just shook his head. And I said, look, wh where are you shooting? They're shooting in Morocco, and they were going to do the mountains later. He said, um, I'll send the music to you while you're filming it, and so the actors can hear the music before the act. He just, and I just went on and on. And finally, he's, he was quiet for a long time. And I said, Marty, we have to do this right now. And he went like this. Okay. <laughs> and he let me do it. And, uh, uh, and in fact, what happened was that uh, I had only, uh, I got up to around the, third, the fourth reel. Oh, I hadn't done the fifth reel yet. And I was on tour with my ensemble. And uh, I got a call from him. And he said, okay, we need the music for the fifth reel. I said, well, when do you need it? He said, I'm starting on Monday. I have to have the music. I must have it now. Well, what was happening, he would take the music and he would play the music for, the, for the, all the actors. And they, were, they got into that process where they, they could hear the music before the, before the scenes. In fact, in some cases, uh, I actually, with Godfrey Reggio, I had the cinematographer listen to the music while he was filming. I really got that far ahead of the game. Uh, uh, and um, so I was, I was in some place, I think it was in London somewhere, and I, 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 I had the weekend also, I flew home, and I, I did the fifth reel in two days, which is a very short time, and I, and I said, okay, this is not... This is, this is kind of what it's going to be, but I'm going to have to redo this. And um, I sent it to him. And uh, I never had to redo it. It worked perfectly. And so, but the point was is that I got him to the point where he wouldn't, he wouldn't film until he had the music. Wow. But that never happened again. <laughs> uh, not with him or anybody else. But anyway, so, but, uh, so this is a... Uh, the, here's the, the point is this. The elements of a film are like, when I said it's like opera, we have, uh, uh, we have text, we have uh, movement, we have image, and we have music. The four, it's like earth, air, fire, and water. The four elements are all there. Um, in any collaborative work, there'll be two or three. Sometimes there'll be four. The only ones that have four will be film and opera. Otherwise, dance will maybe have movement and image or that's a, and music, but it won't have the, the text might not be there. Or it, or play might have not have the movement of that kind. So, but uh, uh, when you did, if you look at it that way, then uh, uh, basically uh, my consideration was that the the, uh, the the emotional point of view of the film will be in the music, 
which I'm convinced that it is. Uh, uh, and, um, and therefore, that should be the basis on which you, you do the rest of it. So actually, the point is, is that the, the, the beginning actually is the script. You have to read that first, and then you can then you can mark it up the way you want to, and then you can put the music where you like. Uh, but you, uh, the only people that have really let me do that, Godfrey Reggio, who did the Cassie movies, we did all the movies like that. And uh, sometimes Earl Morris, a little bit, he let me do it, but not very much. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the filmmaking is a big control business, and the... It's a question of who runs it. Well, you know, it used to be the directors, now it's the producers, and now it's the studios. It's getting worse and worse. It's getting worse and worse. But, and the movies are getting worse too, but no one seems to mind. <laughs> Um, I want to talk a bit more about your collaboration with uh, both Godfrey Gut Radio and Errol Morris, but I think it's time for you to play oh, the first Okay, I'm going to play a piece which actually ended up being in a film. Uh, I just remember that, and it was uh, in, actually in Errol Morris's film. Uh, uh, let's see, I think it was called The Thin Blue Line. I think it's the music that you hear at the very beginning. And... Uh, i might have written the music for uh, the film and then made it into, actually it's a piano piece I play all the time now. It's a short piece, about six minutes.
thank you. That did uh, indeed really send me back to the Thin Blue Line. It's that that movie is so powerful. I watched it actually a couple of years ago in New York in a restored uh, new transfer, and it's such a yeah, that, that, an amazing film. It's a film about a man that was uh, in jail in Houston for a murder he hadn't had anything to do with, and the film begins with the what you what you see with that music is the skyline of Houston. No, it was Dallas. Sorry. Mm-hmm. It was Skyland of Dallas, and you hear uh, uh, the, the voice of, the, of this huge person, I forget his name, and he says, uh, my mother said to me once, if there were, ever was a hell on earth, it was Dallas. And that's the music you heard. <laughs> <laughs> on the soundtrack, there's a lot of the, the interviews from the film kind of melded into your music in a really beautiful brilliant way like the, you hear these interviews like intersected with your music and um, it's interesting because I met Errol Morris at um, ITFA at documentary festival in Amsterdam last year and um, he was asked about this like uh, this way that music and words kind of went together and he said for him the words were music as well Um, and then he also said that uh, you and him apparently originally had the same music teacher, that you and Errol Morris had the same music teacher in well, original. He, he had, uh, he actually had been to music school. Yeah. He was a uh, cellist. Yeah. In fact, to the, if I write music for him, he'll ask me to send him the score. Yeah. And he'll sit down and play it on the piano, yeah. which is a little discomforting. I'm not particularly interested in having the director play the music on the piano. <laughs> but it's such an integral part of, of the movies that you've done together. Well, yes, but he, uh, he has his own, we have our own, he has a, he also likes to put music in places where I didn't intend it. He, he, I think he does that just to tease me. <laughs> but it's, I've sent him a score, it's never, this music is always there, but it's never in the form that I sent it to him. But it works amazingly well. well. I know. I think yeah. it's just uh, a little. As I said, the the, uh, the film world is full of uh, control and power issues. It's one of the fog of war. Uh, 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 well, it yeah. happens uh, all yeah. through the film business. Yeah. Yeah. Where the the the, uh, the picture editor tries to tell the composer how to write. Oh, come on! You know that yeah, exactly. Yeah, they it happens all the lot. time. Yeah. And there, they spend hours and hours in the editing room with the director so they have a but now with uh, when I work with Marty his editor was uh, Thomas Schoonmacher who we worked with a long time and um, I had finished the music but I went uh, I was very interested in Marty's ideas about film and he liked to talk about he knows everything about film so I I spent I spent a lot of time in the editing room with him not because he would uh, we had differences of opinions and he always won of course Um, I mean, there was one place where, where there was a, I had written a, a, a piece of music and he said, uh, no, the trombone's in the wrong place. I said, no, what do you mean? He said, no, the trombone has to come later. And I said, look, Marty, I can't do that. He said, what do you mean you can't do it? I said, well, I wrote this piece in the form of a chaconne and explained what a chaconne was. This is a repeated harmonic pattern. I said, and so the trombone can only come in at the beginning of the pattern, so it can't come in the middle somewhere. And he went, oh, just put it in what I told you. <laughs> so, uh, so um, no, actually what he did, actually, he said, he said, let me show you something. And he took out the shoot, he had a shooting script that he worked from. And in it, it was this particular scene, and it was a certain place where Uh, there was a, the camera angle was going to change and the light was going to go up on the, the figure and he put, and he put a, a mark over that. He said, I want the trombone there. In other words, what he did, now he did, a, I don't know many people that did that. He would, he would have a shooting script and he would actually put in the lighting uh, moves. Wow. He, would, he, would, he actually planned the whole movie before he shot it. But then uh, he wanted the music to conform to it. So, of course... He ruined my chaconne, but he was happy. Yeah. <laughs>
How about your collaboration with the Godfrey Regio on the Katsi trilogy? Well, and also Godfrey, um, Godfrey does really let me do pretty much what I want. Uh, uh, we've done six movies now. Uh, he's, I got a seventh one who's starting to work on. And uh, we usually were working at the same time. The, uh, when we, were, we begin working, he's working on the first reel. Because that's, he, he runs out of money by the second reel. And he has to stop. And has to go and get the money. So it, it can take... Uh, Ken Escasi took about three years to finish. Not because he was working on it for three years, but he was raising money for three years. Uh, so what would happen... Uh, we would... Uh, I was living in New York, and he was uh, living in Venice, California, which is Los Angeles. And about every month or so, I would fly to out to California, and I would look and see what, how it was getting along with it. And he, uh, I would write the music, I would send it to him, and there would only be maybe 10 minutes completed at that moment. And then he would, uh, he would show me what he was doing, and... Uh, Basically, he was cutting the, to the movie, to the to the music. Uh, okay, it was uh, I could much I could work much more quickly than he could because the materials of music are, are very fluid; they're very easy to work with. The materials of film are very complicated and expensive. Uh, so to reshoot a film can be a disaster for uh, for a low budget film because they don't, may not have the money actually to do it. Uh, uh, well, we didn't have the money either, but, but basically, he didn't have the money until the very end of the end of the picture, uh, and so it took it took a long time to to do that. But during that time, we had time to uh, we had time to put the images and the music together, and uh, mostly I started, and then he would do something, and then I would add to it, or then he would basically. Uh, I, I would say, how long is this image, how long is this scene? He said, well, let's say it's nine minutes. So I would write a piece that was nine minutes long. And he said, well, it's actually a little bit long. And so I would cut it down to what he wanted. And so basically, we would shape the music and the images together. And we did it kind of scene by scene. Uh, but we... Uh, uh, I also, besides that, I... Uh, I, I, uh, usually the film wasn't even completely a film, uh, uh, photographed yet. So we, uh, and I normally would go out, uh, uh, I would go and, and to, the, to, the, uh, to the shooting sessions too. So when we were doing a, a, a Poakatsi, which uh, we'll be playing next week in, uh, in, in Norway, um, when, we, when we were, He would, he would uh, um, I would go with him to, uh, uh, he was shooting in South America, and I would go there and, and see where, 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 that film is in the Cerro Paleo mines, of uh, gold mines in Brazil. And uh, I knew that's where we were going to start. But there was a film that Cousteau made, Jacques Cousteau made, of that same place. It was in black and white, but it was the same place. And an earlier version of it, but it was still the same. And I saw it, so I knew what it looked like. So I wrote a piece. That, that piece was about, uh, it was for the opening of the film. And then I, uh, I made a, uh, what we call a work tape or a demo tape. And uh, I, I, when we got there, I gave it to uh, the, uh, the cinematographer. And he, uh, he had a headset and... He, he listened to it while he was filming. So we were, and, uh, so while he was filming, uh, he was listening to the music that he was filming to. Wow. Now, okay, no, well, it gets even better than that. <laughs> so then, uh, so the guys that were working in the mines are all about 17, they're very young. And uh, I, had this, I had learned, uh, I began studying Portuguese so I could speak with them. So, so they, and they said, Okay, ask what are you okay, uh, uh, What are you doing here? And I said, oh, we're, making, uh, we're, making a, we're making a film. And they said, Can we put your V? Can we hear it? And I said, See. Si. And, and so I, I uh, uh, the, the first guys, and see, this was uh, the kind of coal mine where 
uh, they're taking the uh, dirt up to the top and it goes through a sluice and the water goes over it and the gold stays in the water and the dirt goes out. That's how it works there. And uh, so they had to carry these huge bags up, the, uh, up, up these ladders. And um, uh, so, uh, so, I, uh, and I, so I played the, I, I play this, for, I played the music for them. And after a while, uh, there were a lot of guys there, but in, we were in one part of, the mo- uh, of, of, that, of that location. So maybe 12 or 15 people heard the music. And I played it for them. And then they, and they said, Todebe, very good, very good. They liked the music. Uh, they, they were very, very young. These, I think they were about 17 or 18 years old. And uh, I said, what are you doing here? And they said, oh, there's gold everywhere, everywhere. And I said, well, what are you going to do with the money? And they said, one guy said, well, I'm going to go home to my town and open a VW uh, car. You know, that's, they had these kind of yeah. They were trying to get enough money to... But, Actually, they never did that. What happened is that they would, uh, when you were, uh, we were there for three or four days, and um, uh, when they would find a nugget, a nugget would, could fit in your palm, your hand like that, just a gold nugget, they could find a whole nugget like that. Wow. And that could be worth about $30,000. And when every once in a while you would hear this roar coming from someplace because someone had found a nugget. And uh, in the mornings they would be lined up I mean, I, I, it was very, very interesting to be there. And, and, and of course, it was interesting for me because well, I, I had written the music, but then once I had been there, I saw, that the, that the, I saw how young they were. I didn't realize that from uh, looking at the Cousteau movie, that they were very young. So I decided to, uh, to uh, have a children's choir. Uh, and and I, got a, I, I found some text for that. And I added it to the music that was there. So when you hear that piece now, if you go listen to what's called Poakatsi, it begins with this, it's a very, very energetic piece. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, it's almost like a dance. And it evokes a feeling of, the, of these young people, that, that you start to see how, that they really are like children. And then you hear the children singing. So if I hadn't gone there, mm. I wouldn't have seen that and I wouldn't have known that, and that element would not have been in the film. So that just gives you an idea. What are the when you go to this, when you can see actually what's going on, uh, it'll change the way you write the music. Yeah, inspiration works both ways. Inspiration works both ways. So uh, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 uh, there were so many funny stories about that place, but <laughs> let, we, let's go on. <laughs> I just wanted to. Uh, to ask you shortly about Woody Allen because you mentioned him yourself Woody Allen uh, as uh, I mean for me it was so amazing that he suddenly worked with you as a composer on one of his movies I heard that even that movie Cassandra uh, was his first movie in stereo because usually he works only in mono but then your music came in and then he he did that in stereo oh Oh. Woody has a very, his schedule is as he, he, he writes his films in the winter time in, Je- in February and March. He shoots them in the summer. He edits them in the fall. And around the beginning of December, he goes on tour with his band. He has a little clarinet. He plays clarinet. And so he does that every year. He does a movie every year. Uh, that just was the movie that I got. And mostly he does what we call needle drops. Mm, exactly. He, he takes scores, and he, he doesn't really work with a lot of composers, and so he didn't... When I met him, and uh, I got a call saying that Mr. Allen's going to call you. I'm, it's a good thing they had told me that, because if someone... I picked up the phone and said, this is Woody Allen, I would have hung it up. I would, <laughs> it was obviously a prank call, but it, it was going to be Woody Allen. He called up, he said he wanted to talk about a film, and I went to see him. And uh, he had never done this. He had never worked with a, live comp- a living composer. So I looked at the film, I said, I can do this. And he said, oh, okay. And then he said, now what do we do? I said, well, Woody, we have to spot the movie. And he said, well, what's that? I said, well, you have to tell me where the, put the music. He said, he just went like this, no, 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 no. No, no, 
I'm not going to do that. I said, well, how are we going to do this? He said, he said, I just put the music in. I said, well, where does it go? He says, well, put the music in where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a funny guy. I did that, and on, on, I made two mistakes, not really. Uh, mostly he didn't say anything, made no comment about where I, the placement. One time he said, oh, there's no music there. I said, oh, look, I'll, I'll just write a different piece. I, didn't think, I thought he didn't like the piece. He said, no, no, there's no music there. I said, Woody, I can, I'll have it ready for, I'll have it, you can have it tomorrow. He said, no, no, I don't want any music there. I said, oh, okay, so I took, took it out. Then a, 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 this happened over a period of weeks, so about a week or so later, we got to another place in the film. He said, oh, is there music there? And I said, yes. He said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, he had very little, he, he almost never said anything. Wow. Uh, so he said, well, what can I do to help? What's one, you're done the music, I said, well, I'll come up here and I'll bring you the demos, but I'm not playing it for your picture editor. Uh, uh, I'm going to play it for you. I don't want to hear from someone else what you thought. Mm -hmm. So you're going to tell me. He said, okay. So I would go up there and then he would... Uh, he, it was very funny. So I would sit like a chair, and there was a, the, the uh, council was there. In those days, we, oh, I think we were doing digital movies by then. Oh. So uh, you didn't have all the stuff hanging on the walls the way you used to, you know. So uh, they would put up the music, and, and then they would play the cue, and then he would, he would be behind me, and after the cue, there would be a moment of silence, and then he would lean down and say in my ear, Good. <laughs> That's all he said. Wow. Then, now, at the beginning, uh, now it was a, this film, uh, you know, he does these murder films too, besides the funny films, the romantic films. He does these, this is a triple murder film. The two guys, uh, the two murderers get killed, but they, the guy that they murdered is also killed. So three people get killed uh -huh. all at the end of the movie. So I knew it was a, it's a really, so I decided, I didn't know what, what what, what, what he was like at all. I didn't know what he would like to hear. But I decided that on the very first piece, I better find out. So if I was going to get fired, I'd rather be fired in the first week. That way I get paid and I can go home. <laughs> but uh, so uh, the first piece was the credits. So I decided to write a kind of Verity overture, kind of like Rigoletto, something really, really down, really mean. So I wrote a really dark piece. And it was about four, three or four minutes, just long for the credits. So I put it up and he looked at it and he said, well, that's very dark. I said, I said, I know it's very dark. He said, well, maybe we should start with something less dark. He said, okay, I'll write you something else. He said, no, 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 no. Let me listen to it for a while. I said, look, Woody, if you do it this way, then at the end, after the t double murder at the end, we can put that at the end again, and then we'll know why it was there. <laughs> at the beginning, we won't know, but at the end, it'll be the same exact piece. Only instead of being the overture, it'll be it'll be like the end of the uh, it'll be like the, the the end of the tragedy. And he just didn't say anything. Then he went off. Uh, he went off to uh, do his tour in December. We hadn't finished editing yet, so I didn't know how it ended. And he never told me. So finally I got a message to go up. He said, you can come and see the movie now. So I got Michael Reisman. That's the fellow uh, that was sitting opposite me last night on the piano. That Michael uh, makes the demos with me. At that time he did. And so I said, Michael, come up. We can look at Woody's new movie. So we got up there. And everything was where it was supposed to be. And we got the end. And first of all, he used the overture for the, where I wanted it. I got the end, and he put it there. I said, oh. <laughs> so I, like, I like Woody. I, I thought, uh, but you know, <laughs> I think that maybe the experiences for Woody and for Marty were too intense because I never heard from either of them again. <laughs> but I mean, they, they actually, met, uh, in that world, people change, uh, you generally change people all mm. the time anyway. Philip, um, yeah, we could go on and on, but 
You yeah, should I, also I know play a lot another of stories, piece. but we don't yeah, have exactly. that much time. Um, you have one more piece, piano piece to play. Um, and um, that's going to round off today's talk. Uh, this, so. this is a piece that uh, wasn't uh, <clears throat> actually for a film. Uh, it was actually written for an, uh, the organ of St. Uh, cathedral St. John the Divine in New York, which is a very big, uh, it's the biggest cathedral we have in New York. And uh, that, uh, uh, again, the, the, the Dalai Lama was involved with this one too, uh, because he was giving a talk there, and the people who were uh, asked him to give the talk uh, weren't sure when he would come, so they asked me to write a piece of indefinite length, which was kind of right something I don't have trouble doing. So I, uh, I wrote this piece for the organ, and then uh, later, uh, Lucinda Charles, who was the choreographer of, of the, most of the performances of Einstein, she did those, except for the very first ones. Um, she took it, and uh, she turned, I, by that time, I turned it into a piano piece. And uh, she calls it Mad Rush, and she turned it into a dance. So, uh, again, this is a piece that began as a music piece and ended up being a dance piece. Uh, the other one ended up being a film piece and ended up being a concert piece. So this is how this happens. It's a little bit longer. It was, the the uh, length of the piece was, uh, he was only 14 minutes late. So that's how long the piece is. <laughs> right.
Well, thank you for coming out. Thank you to Philip Glass. Thank you. Thank you to Click Festival and Copenhagen Picks. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this conference. Welcome to Christian Spohr, the house of the Danish Parliament Folketinget. I'm not in the organizing committee at all. I'm, my name is Knud Wilby. I'm the practical guy here who are trying to keep track and to facilitate the deba debate uh, during the day. I've been looking forward. I've been through the program. It looks extremely interesting also because it's not just about theoretical thoughts about uh, basic income, but about the practical experience in taking part in, in different parts of, of Europe and the rest of the world. As, as, as said, I said, I have to be the practical person. I will be the timekeeper. It's, it's kind of a tough schedule. That's also why we try to be quite punct punctual. Uh, as you can see this morning's session, we have three interventions each 20 minutes. After that, we have a debate also for about uh, 20 minutes. This means we, we have to, to stick to the timetable to be able to come through the program uh, during the day. The official welcome you'll have from Uffe Elbeck, uh, head of the New Danish Party, the Alternative, former Minister of Culture and former a lot of other things. Welcome, Uffe. And thank you for that. Uh, introduction and uh, good morning all you brave people and uh, it's very uh, precise that I say brave people because uh, first of all it's I think it's the first uh, conference here in the Danish Parliament about basic income and uh, I know when I look over uh, the top of the crowd I see a lot of gray-haired people and uh, you, speak, you should be proud of that because that means that you have been uh, struggling for a long time to discuss uh, how can we reinvent society as we know it today and how can we imagine another future. And it has been a long process, but I think uh, there's a window of opportunity right now where we see in different parts of the world uh, a very fresh discussion about how can we reorganize uh, the society? How can we reorganize the way we understa understand economy? How can we uh, uh, yeah, reimagine what it means to work? And uh, how can we also reimagine uh, what does it mean to have a, an identity? Uh, most people these days, when you meet them, the first thing you ask them is, uh, what job do you have? So there's a very specific uh, link between uh, identity, self-understanding, and the job you have. And I think uh, part of the discussion you have to have today is uh, uh, interlinked with uh, some of these uh, questions I've just raised. From the alternative, we are very happy to be the host for the conference. We have nothing to do with the program, uh, besides that uh, I'm speaking to you right now. But we have been uh, able to secure the space and the platform you use right now. And I think that's, uh, for us, it's a big honor uh, to be able to, to support you in, uh, in this manner. When we speak about uh, a new economy uh, uh, in the alternative, uh, we also talk about how, uh, how can we be sure that we don't disappear in what we call the political uh, Bermuda Triangle. And uh, the Bermuda Triangle in this uh, specific discussion is a triangle that consists of three enormous challenges. One, one is the climate crisis. How, how can, uh, what is our, uh, the climate crisis for us uh, changed everything. The way we understand production, consumerism, uh, economy, uh, etc. So that is, that's one angle of the Bermuda tri Triangle, political Bermuda Triangle. The other triangle is uh, how does uh, the technology uh, development uh, affect uh, our uh, job market, our work market? 
uh, that have come out some uh, uh, surveys just recently here in Denmark that up till around 800,000 jobs as we know it today will disappear in the next 20 years. So climate crisis, the technology uh, uh, challenges, and the, the last one is the economic uh, system. And uh, the economic system, as, as we see it, is uh, are facing its own uh, limitation. Uh, even uh, if we are talking from a neoliberal economy perspective, which we really don't want, but uh, if, we, if we step into their shoes, even the, new, uh, the neoliberal economy are facing their own limits. Uh, the, the, the fantasy about uh, uh, large-scale growth in the, econom uh, the economic system is a just, it, it is a fantasy. Since uh, the 70s, 80s, we haven't seen uh, a large grow, uh, economic growth uh, rate, uh, rates in, in our part of the world. So th this uh, uh, pol uh, political uh, Bermuda Triangle, with the climate crisis, the technology, and the limit, limitation of the way we understand the economic system today. In that triangle, we can disappear. But in that triangle, we can also uh, imagine another future. And that's where your discussion about uh, basic incomes uh, comes into the play. Because uh, if we uh, try to secure a, a, a new social uh, security base for everyone in our society. We have to discuss what, what potential do we have when it comes to the basic income. And uh, in the alternative, we haven't uh, gone all the way. Uh, the, we, we've gone so far that we say that uh, we think it's important to make uh, experiments when it comes to basic income. We have to make some pilot projects and figure out what, what works, what doesn't work. And if it works, let's scale it up. And I know that that's part of, of the discussion you, you are going to have here today, is to figure out what, what can we learn from the Finnish examples, what can we learn from the Canadian examples, what can we learn from the UK examples. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy that uh, there's this opportunity to share experience, good and bad. Another question uh, which we're discussing uh, in the alternative is, is there's always a light side and a dark side to everything. Uh, so uh, most of you guys are, of course, looking into the light side of the uh, basic income. But what is the dark side of basic income? Some of our colleagues also from the UK, which uh, we are talking with, are hi highlighting that, uh, that we sh should be aware that if we, are, we understand basic income uh, in the wrong way, that's actually, uh, in a way, uh, pushing people to a very passive role. You will get your money, please be quiet. It's your own destiny. You have to secure your own uh, life. You get a check, over and out. And that's for sure not the way we understand basic income in, in, uh, in, uh, in the alternative. We think it's extremely important to, uh, to uh, go up against the bureaucratic system and the control system as we have it in Denmark when it comes to people on uh, social welfare. <coughs> and we have to uh, understand that if, uh, uh, if we uh, uh, give people responsibilities, they, they will be res responsible. And we have to understand that uh, we want to motivate people positively uh, so that's uh, the reason why we are so up against and we debate it and we, we want to change the whole control system as we, uh, we have it today in, in Denmark when it comes to people with, on social welfare. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, on the other hand, did you see that? Mm. He thinks, I'm running out of time. And uh, that's totally sure, uh, I'm running out of time, but, uh, but I just also want to recommend you that uh, be honest and also talk about both light side and dark side uh, when it comes to uh, the whole discussion about basic income. And see basic income as only one of the building blocks to, to a new econ economic model. And uh, that's uh, our task uh, at, the, uh, at the alternative is to start the discussion about what kind of economic model will come after the present version of capitalism. Because 
there has to come another economic model. We know parts of it, we discussed parts of it, and you will do it uh, as well here today, but that's actually the big Apollo project, to figure out what is the next economic model. And basic income has, can play a very important role in that discussion. But basic, welcome, you brave people. And be brave, be honest, and uh, try to really to also uh, talk about the risky questions. Don't be too polite, but be nice. So uh, have a good morning and have a good conference. And this morning's session basically is about implementation, about practical experiences in different countries. And the uh, first speaker is uh, uh, Guy Standing, Professor of Development Studies at University of London, co-president of the Basic Income Earth Network, known for a lot of things. I just picked this book here, The Precariat, which has been discussed a lot also in this country over the last uh, few months. Uh, the, this whole change the new dangerous class, there's a lot of fear in the world today, a lot of danger, but th this, is, this is one factor contributing to a lack of stability, possibly. Please, guys standing. Good morning, and uh, one of the great pleasures of being in Bien, the basic income movement, is that we move around and it's like a journey and we're always meeting friends along the journey and it's so nice to see so many people that we've got to know over the years. It's a great pleasure. My job this morning is to set the context for our two-day debate and I'm delighted that we had the leader of the Alternative to open because my view movements like the Alternative represent the precariat. There are movements growing everywhere, and we need such movements. And fundamental to this alternative, of course, is basic income. Now, for me, this is a particularly poignant month because it's our 30th anniversary. 30th anniversary this month when we founded Bien and began a long journey. When we started, we were a group of much longer-haired individuals, radicals, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. <laughs> and what's great is to see so many people about the age I was then, today, and in our movement, taking over from us. And where's Carl? Because Carl is doing a fantastic job with Louise as co-chairs, but they should be looking behind them for the next generation to take over from them, and it's great. Because we're growing strong, and that's the first point that I'm delighted to say. And this year has become a particularly strong year. And a lot of people are joining from strange positions on the right, on the left. Suddenly, they're inventing basic income. You read blogs every day where someone, my idea is a basic income. It's, it's great. Second, I've just published a book, which I have a few copies if anyone is interested, which is my sort of defining approach to basic income. And it takes the Paynean, Thomas Paine arguments forward. It's called The Corruption of Capitalism. It's about rentier capitalism and how we can use that as a moral and economic justification for funding a basic income. And the third, and I can boast on this one relative to everybody here, is that for my pains, and I've lost a lot of hair and aged a lot, but I have actually been involved in doing five pilot basic income schemes. And there's one thing I can guarantee, only one thing about pilots. You will make mistakes. That's the only thing I can guarantee. Now, I want to reiterate a point which is at outside pilots. But we must remember the justification for a basic income as 
what, however we see it, is fundamentally about social justice. We believe in a basic income because it's an instrument for promoting and strengthening social justice. That's first. The second is we believe in a basic income because it enhances freedom. Enhances what we call republican freedom. The freedom to be not dominated. The freedom of exit. The freedom to say no. Right? And the third reason we support basic income is it's a means of giving us basic security. We need security in order to be rational, to have mental health, and all of the other things. Security is fundamental. Now, for none of those three things, do we need pilots? Right? Because they're fundamental about our values. And therefore, we have to be very careful what we want from pilots and what they can do and what they cannot do. Now, at the moment, we have what I began calling at the beginning of this year the year of the pilots, because suddenly they're sexy. You know, they're sexy. So we have pilot in Finland. We have pilots in Dutch cities, all going to take place. We have Ontario, where I've just been, where Hugh Siegel is promoting a pilot. We have Sam Altman I met earlier this year in a very strange place, and he's pledged $20 million to do a pilot in California, and I'm going there shortly to be advising them. We have Give Directly sprouting up. We have wonderful programs on TV. We have crowdfunding basic income pilots in Germany, Netherlands, USA. I was in New Zealand and the New Zealand Labour Party. Oh, New Zealand Labour Party has come out in favour of pilots. Jeremy Corbyn, with whom we've been working behind the scenes. I hope he survives. I hope he survives. And John McDonald, his, his backup man, as it were, they are committed to doing pilots, and we have the alternative, and the Scottish Nationalists and others. So we've got this coming up. Very interesting. But we are in dangerous waters. Very dangerous, because in the name of basic income, are these really basic income pilot schemes? It's the big question. My fear is that too many of them are using the name of basic income, but are far from it. And then I ask myself, is it good or bad that these are being called basic income pilots? In a sense, it's good because it's extending the debate. It's making more and more people familiar. But it's potentially bad if it leads to a direction of social policy that none of us in this room should be supporting. A move towards social engineering and libertarian paternalism where you use the policy to steer people to behave in certain ways, incentivize them to do X rather than Y because the state wants that. I hope none of us in this room want these pilots to go in that direction. The third point is that there's a political danger that the rhetoric of pilots could be a smokescreen to postpone real reform. There is that danger. I think we can defeat that danger, but only if we recognize it. Now let us just remember for the sake of the conversation we're going to have in the next two days, what a basic income means. I hope most of us are familiar, but let me just remind ourselves. First of all, it's a basic income. This means that it must be an amount that makes a substantial difference to security, freedom, and justice. It's not a total security. We don't want a high income like that. We might dream of it, but that's not the immediate objective, right? 
The second thing is it must be paid in cash. The third, it must involve a regular payment, not a lump sum. Some of these schemes are doing lump sums, and that's not a basic income scheme. The next is that it must be individual and not household or family-based. It's an individual. And then we get into troubling waters that Ollie and my friends in our movement squirm about. It must be universal. It must not be for the unemployed and not the employed. It must not be for those who are in particular statuses. It's universal or it isn't anything. A universal scheme exists because the community effects, the solidarity effects, are important, not just the individual effects. That is very important. And of course, the next aspect it's unconditional in behavioral terms. In other words, you get the money and you're not being told you've got to do it, this, spend it in this way or that way, or behave in this way or that way, or have behaved in this way or that way. It's unconditional in behavioral terms. And it's non-withdrawable. Now, all of those aspects are interrelated and are equally important. You cannot give priority to one and then say, uh, forget the others. Now, there is two other points, background points, that we should always bear in mind. One school of thought, which has been very, very dominant in our discourse, but which is not mine, is that a basic income should replace all other social benefits. This is the libertarian way of looking at it, or replace most benefits, or some benefits. That is one way of approaching it. So you're constantly juggling, well, we'll take this away and give it a The second way of doing it, which I believe is going to be a stronger argument in the future, is to see a basic income as a social dividend, as something separate that is built up as part of a new income distribution system for the 21st century. It's a different way of looking at it because you can approach it in a way of building it up. Now, I want to conclude by mentioning some principles, and if anyone's interested, I've written a boring article about these principles of a basic income. The first one, which is effectively what I've said, is that the pilot's must respect the definition. I believe that neither the Finland experiment as envisaged at the moment, and Ollie will explain all that shortly, nor the Dutch ones, nor the give directly ones, respect the definition. They're not universal, they're selective, and they involve a distortion of the labor market. It's very easy to document these things. The th second point is that the pilot design must be clear and sustainable and transparent. Sounds very simple, but if the policy, if the pilot is an exercise in labor market policy, then it will not advance freedom. It will not advance social justice. Or the things that we've just been hearing about, things like identity and respect for work that is not labor, that matter to us, nor the ecological dimensions that are so important to our debate. The next is that the design of a pilot must be kept constant during the course of a pilot. Then, the pilot must be adequately large. It's no use having a pilot that has 22 people and a dog. There has to be a sufficient number that you can actually examine the effects. And too many of the exercises are not respecting that fundamental point. It's a boring point, but it's important. The next point is that the duration of the pilot must be sufficient to enable the dynamics to take effect. There are learning effects that impact. If I start a pilot tomorrow, you'll be able to see some effects within a couple of weeks. But the real effects take time. It's not like boiling a bloody egg. You know, it's a matter of taking time, seeing the impact, 
seeing if effects wear off, seeing the multiplier effects taking place. And remember this, having been involved in pilots which have taken six years of my life, I warn you that those doing it must have stamina. The fatigue factor is very important. I don't want to tell this very loudly to Ollie just in case he gets demoralized. He's a friend. But that factor has to be taken into account. The next thing is we live in an era of the randomistas. Randomized control trials are sexy and we'll be told they're revolutionizing social policy. Only through randomized control trials can we make any social advance. I have short Anglo-Saxon words for such people. It is useful to have control groups. It's important, it's vital. But you don't actually learn everything through the random Easters. Randomized control trials are all very well for testing a malaria tablet. You can give one that you think works, you give a placebo to somebody else and you give nothing to somebody else and you monitor the effect on the disease. But with a social policy, you can't do that. First of all, you can't have a placebo without a riot. <laughs> Second, you cannot choose him to give a basic income and then the next door neighbor not a basic income. He would be stoned the next morning or he would have to share it. Retributive justice. But you can have a randomized thing like India where a whole community gets the basic income and another community over here does not and you compare. But don't expect Miracles even from that. It's good for low-hanging fruit hypothesis. Does a basic income improve the nutrition of children? Yes or no? Does it improve the health? Yes or no? These are low-hanging fruit hypotheses. They're not that low, let me tell you. But if I talk about emancipation and justice and security for a community and the multiplier effects, they ain't so good. So you could use randomized control trial and sophisticated econometrics and show, ah, look, work has not increased. Therefore, it's a bad scheme. But that's because you're not actually involved in an analysis of the far more important things. OK? So I think randomized control trials are useful. And I've done them. They're boring. but. They're not perfect. The next thing is, in doing pilots, you have to have a baseline survey before it starts, interim surveys, long-term surveys, to see the dynamics. And then, and we are the first, I think, ever to do this, you have to have a survey after the end of the pilot to find out what are the legacy effects, what are the lingering, lasting effects. We did one in India six months after we ended the pilot, and I'm just delighted to tell you that the richest man in India and his delightful wife have just given some more funds for us to do a legacy survey in the communities, plus do a further pilot Shh. in India. And the Indian government is about to issue its economic report early next year when there's going to be a whole chapter, a whole chapter of the government's major economic report about the possibility of moving to a basic income. That's due to the pilots. So it can have effects. The next point, and I really fundamentally urge you, if anybody's interested in doing pilots, to follow this religiously. I'm not religious, but follow this religiously. And that is the hypotheses that you're testing with your pilot must be made explicit before you start the pilot. What is it we are going to test? Because that is going to affect both your design, both the way you implement it, by the design the questionnaires, the survey instruments. It took us six months to design the questionnaires based on a list of hypotheses. 
And the hypotheses add up to, is a basic income transformative? Is it going to have a multiple set of effects? The last point I want to make is this. We are the only pilot, our Indian pilot, to do the two things that most of us in this room believe. The two things are this. To be a rational human being with freedom, you need basic income. But basic income by itself is not enough. You also need basic voice, a sense of agency. If you don't have access to an organization or organizations to represent our interests, even if I give everybody a basic income, we will still remain vulnerable to the bastards, the plutocrats, the powerful bureaucrats, etc. Unless we have voice, collective and individual voice, we will remain vulnerable. So what we've done in the Indian pilots is half the villages had a basic income and no access to a voice. And the other half had basic income and an institutionalized collective voice. And we watched and monitored and analyzed the differences. It will be very interesting in the pilots in industrialized Western countries to take that principle forward because we do need advice. We do need to be able to turn to figures and organization when we are in distress. That's going to be an interesting aspect of the design. So I thank you for listening. I hope we will continue. I hope that the difficulties of doing pilots will not put people off experimenting. But I also urge all of us to make sure that doing pilots is not an excuse for politicians and others to kick basic income into the long grass, as we call it. We've got to do both at the same time. Thank you very much for talk, listening to me. And we'll go right on continuing with, with hearing more about what's going to happen in, in Finland and later on about, hear about the Dutch experience. Uh, Professor Oli Kankas is closely involved in what is happening and what will be happening in Finland. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, is it possible to get the PowerPoint presentation? Uh, Thank you for your invitation, and apologies that my presentation will not be that eloquent as uh, Guy's presentation. He spoke that uh, nicely about freedom, about uh, justice, about uh, everything, about hair, about uh, stamina. I don't have that much to say about hair, and perhaps my presentation is more mundane when it comes to freedom and that kind of things, and when it comes to stamina. I'm a long-distance runner, done a couple of marathons also in this, uh, this city, so that, uh, I hope that I have that stamina. That, uh, and uh, this run I'm running just now has lasted one year, uh, very precise one year. So that uh, we began the run uh, in the mid of September, in the last part of September, we got the order from the Finnish government to start planning the pilot study. So the government wanted to start this experiment because they thought that the social security system that we have just now in Finland is not corresponding to those changes that are taking place in the labor markets. Kai spoke about those changes and we know Everybody here, what kind of changes are taking place? And uh, 
Then the other problem the government wanted to solve by basic income is different kind of disincentives that are built in in the Finnish social security system. Because there are lots of income tested benefits that are on top of each other, and then if the person is getting employment, in that case those benefits are uh, cut down by uh, every single euro people, are, uh, people is earning, and in, the, it can, in that case it means that uh, it doesn't uh, pay to work at all in very many cases. And very often we have a situation that uh, that, that <clears throat> a person who is, uh, let's say, single mother who has two kids, is living in Helsinki, has a uh, rental uh, house, gets uh, unemployment, government, um, unemployment benefit, etc., etc. In that case, the social money she's getting is that much that uh, she should get uh, more than 2,400 euro uh, in salary or wage in order to get more from, from employment than uh, she's getting from uh, the social, uh, social security. Okay, is it possible to uh, have that uh, device where can, I can put uh, forward because uh, there are lots of slides and I will not show everything. So, uh, the experimental budget is 20 million, and uh, the government said that everything should begin in the uh, beginning of 2017, and it meant that we had a very uh, strong time pressure, so that <clears throat> it dealt not that much of stamina, it dealt with, uh, so that uh, I was not a runner of, of 10,000 meters of marathon, but uh, I had to run uh, one mile or so very rapidly. And uh, that's one reason we ended up in that kind of uh, plan as uh, we ended up, as I will uh, show, <coughs> uh, show to you, in, uh, a little bit later show to you. And uh, the government wanted us to experiment how to abolish those disincentives we have so that the, the government didn't have all those fancy ideas and nice ideas as a uh, uh, guy spoke about so that they were very mundane and they wanted to uh, uh, see if it's possible to somehow make uh, work to pay uh, in, in uh, Finland. And somehow I had the feeling that it's a mission impossible and there should be somebody else than me. And they gave four models us to develop and evaluate. The first one was a full basic income that was more than 1,000 euros. And uh, then we had uh, lots of calculations, lots of micro simulations, and lots of evaluations. Uh, and then we decided that uh, that is not our model. And also there were some political reasons, because the social democrats and trade unions hadn't accepted this kind of proposal at all. And then we thought that, okay, it, it's a political reality and we have to take it into consideration and then we gave up that. And then uh, negative income tax was one possibility. And the problem in Finland is that we by now don't have updated income register that's uh, on the basis of uh, on uh, daily or weekly or monthly basis. It's only annual basis. And as Kai said, uh, we should have given a lump sum for people. Uh, and uh, instead of that, we thought that, okay, it's not uh, possible for us for the time being. 2020, we will have that kind of register, and then it would be possible to do that kind of tricks with, uh, with negative income tax. But uh, the government wanted to start it by now, or very rapidly, and in the beginning of 2017. And then other models. Uh, it's a, uh, a kind of participatory uh, basic income where we pay a little sum and then some extra in the case that people will do some useful uh, in society. But then we decided that uh, it's very difficult for us to decide what is useful in our society and who defines what is useful and who uh, inspects what people are doing and how much should we pay for this and that and that. And then finally, in the end of the day, we had partial income, and then we thought that, okay, we make calculations that the 550 is the smallest sum that we can propose, and then we make calculations up to 850. And then uh, political realities. Uh, the dotted line here is a mark that the parties about that 
uh, positive uh, uh, in relation to basic income and parties that are below the dotted line, they are against it. And uh, the funny thing is that in the present government, we have only center party that's in favor. The conservatives and true Finns are strongly against. So that it was a strange combination because uh, only in addition to center party, the Greens and the left wing league are in favor, but other parties are against. And you can imagine which kind of political uh, game and, and uh, intrigues they were behind the curtains when we were uh, proposing this, so that the, the support was coming for center party, but then the other parties in the government, they were a little bit reluctant or, or not that eager to, to go ahead in this question. So that uh, I will write about that, but uh, not as long as I'm running, but uh, after this run, I will uh, write a very interesting book about political decision making. <clears throat> Uh, uh, the expert group that consisted of lots of economists and lots of social scientists and uh, lawyers, we proposed that the whole adult population should be target for the, the uh, experiment. And then uh, we did some uh, limitations uh, on the basis of age and uh, also on the basis of income because uh, our budget was limited and then we thought that, okay, let's uh, concentrate on low income people because the, the effects uh, work incentives that in, uh, government was mostly interested in uh, are, are the strongest. And then we had that uh, bad word randomization, nation le level randomization that we thought that uh, it will be represented for the whole country and then there will be local experiments uh, that take uh, into account those local effects as in some, uh, some uh, international or uh, some experiments in other countries. And to increase the sample size, uh, because we had uh, limited budget, 20 millions, and it uh, means that if we had taken persons that are not getting anything else from the social security system, in that case, the compensation or basic income should be taken from the uh, running budget or the experiment or experimental budget. In that case, we should or could have uh, something like 1,500 uh, people in the experiment, and that's too much. And then the government, in its wisdom, uh, decided that we can use uh, those social security benefits that are already in payment uh, to uh, somehow be faked uh, basic income. And then we thought that, okay, we could have uh, almost 10,000 persons included in the sample. And uh, we had uh, fancy ideas that there uh, would be different levels of basic income and then also different levels and di different tax systems that are linked to those, uh, those basic income systems, and then we could uh, get comparative data on bad basic income and good basic income systems, and then bad uh, taxation systems and good taxation systems. And we did, did lots of power calculations, how much we should have this kind of persons or that kind of persons to get reliable results. But what happened in the end was that uh, the basic income is uh, 560 euros a month. It's net and it corresponds to the basic level of unemployment com basic unemployment compensation. On top of that uh, uh, are coming other social security benefits like housing allowances, in some cases also uh, social assistance benefits, etc., etc., child allowance, so that it's not replacing, uh, it's replacing very many of those benefits that are or basic, basic sickness benefit, basic unemployment compensation, basic rehabilitation, etc. And uh, social benefits that, uh, as I said, that the social benefits that exceeds uh, that level, exceed that level, uh, they will be paid out as, uh, as uh, nowadays. And because it's a compulsory or obligatory participation, uh, we should have a certificate that nobody will lose because the constitution will say that we can't do uh, obligatory uh, experiment in the case that somebody will be obliged to take a smaller sum of money as uh, she or he is uh, getting just now. And then uh, we decided, or they decided, uh, who made the law, uh, so that two, perhaps 3,000 uh, unemployed person who is 
who are getting uh, unemployment compensation from uh, the social insurance institution uh, are taken uh, as experimental group. And it's a random selection from uh, like uh, 150,000 uh, un unemployed people who are getting that basic benefit. Uh, and the rest of the, the uh, kind of, of control group. And follow-up studies will be, will be based on registers, interviews, and, uh, and uh, uh, different kind of surveys. Now, why? Uh, we began to make a code that uh, it was uh, not that fancy code, that, that uh, suite that came out. Uh, there were constitutional constraints. First of all, uh, equal treatment, and then all those fancy designs that we had on different levels uh, were dropped out because uh, it uh, hadn't been worked. And also, uh, those different levels had been very difficult to model in legislation because we had to write a law. Everything should be based on law. And then tax authorities were not Ill involved in the writing of the law, therefore tax-free. And it's a lot of criticism that it's a tax-free uh, income. But the, the political reality was that the uh, conservative minister of finance never ever gave order to the tax authorities to participate in this. And then tax authorities said that uh, we will not participate unless the minister is uh, giving an order to participate. And therefore, uh, tax-free. And uh, only Kela employed, unemployed, it was easy to get a sample from there, and also it's a cheap sample. And uh, we had a kind of, to my mind, a clever idea, background idea there that uh, we could uh, send spare money for the real experiment that will hopefully start in 2018, and we can expand uh, the, the target group to the whole, uh, not only to unemployed persons, but uh, the other, other things also. And time pressure was extremely strong, and then ICT system uh, was unable, or with Kela, the social insurance system was, was unable to, to, to uh, create ICT system to pay out. And the reactions on the bill were devastating, so that the social democrats, uh, they were against us. They were against us already at the very beginning, and now they were extremely critical and uh, also critical to me. So that uh, how a scientist who has some uh, self-respect can ever propose that kind of silly thing. The Greens, who are in favor of basic income, they were furious. It's a deliberate falsification of basic income. The same with left-wing league. Christian Democrats wanted to have a universal credit system, in the uh, UK type. Center party criticized that the youth are not included. But they said that, uh, that, that uh, okay, this is a start. It's a, it's a good start, and uh, let's plan a better, better one. And uh, the only guys who were uh, somehow in favor of our experiment were economists. They, of course, criticized that it's, a cost, it's not a cost neutral because taxation is not there, but they uh, said that, okay, this is a very good start, and uh, let's wait for it better. And what will happen next? Uh, the Minister of Social Affairs will uh, write the bill uh, that will be proposed to the government. Uh, the government will propose it to, to the parliament, and then parliament will discuss it. And uh, it's very interesting to see what uh, the Constitutional Committee will say about it. I have somehow managed to convince the Social Democrat leader of of the uh, Social Security Committee that, uh, that uh, she's in favor of this experiment, but let's see, let's see what will happen uh, in, in her party group. But anyway, the, the Constitutional Committee is a very crucial one uh, for, for the future, future uh, of, of this experiment. And uh, now it uh, seems to be so that uh, we can expand the uh, sample by including some other uh, groups, because we have uh, lots of money, not lots of money, but uh, let's say 14 millions left, and then the government has said that perhaps there will be something more, and then also some other institutions uh, have said that perhaps they will contribute, so that uh, we are hoping for uh, getting something like uh, 20 millions more. Uh, more. 
And uh, to the critics about the small sample, okay, it's very easy to expand in the case that uh, we used the uh, employed persons so that we could have very easily 6,000, 7,000 unemployed persons, but uh, it doesn't solve that problem that it's a selective group of people. And then uh, other groups, then unemployed or other groups that are getting social benefits, they are expensive for the running budget or the experiment. But uh, in the case the tax system is involved and the tax collected on income that's coming on top of basic income is somehow returned to the experiment, in that case uh, we can expand uh, the, the uh, uh, number of people further. And uh, then there's a question, obligatory or voluntary participation, and also the question that uh, how to deal with, uh, with the local experiment. The problem with the involving a whole municipality in the experiment is that the municipalities in Finland are, um, not all of them are pretty big, but the, those municipalities where it's possible or clever to have that kind of experiment, they, they uh, have something like uh, more than 20,000 uh, 20, inhabitants. So that there must be some uh, aerial or local experiments, not the municipal experiments. And uh, yeah, let's see. So that the, the next step is that we will get uh, 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 some kind of verdict uh, from the Constitutional Committee and that's important in that sense that if Constitutional Committee says that it's not possible to make the kind of human experiments, in that case it's done. So that it's, uh, it's over. Uh, but uh, let's hope that uh, they will say that it's possible to do mm -hmm. that and then we will have something more in the beginning of 2018 and we have more time to plan the legislation, we have more time to plan ICT technology, mm -hmm. we have more time to plan a better, better sample uh, uh, than we had now. So this is a kind mm -hmm. of short survey mm -hmm. of my running. Ubetinget basisinkomst. Jamen det handler om, at uh, skal de sige, hvem jeg hedder, hvem jeg er, og sådan noget, vi har det, eller... En lille indtægt til alle mennesker, også selvom de ikke arbejder. Hey! Også dem, der er for syge til at arbejde. Også dem, der ikke kan finde job lige nu. Uh, så det handler simpelthen om at sikre, at hver eneste sjæl på den her jord har en lille indtægt at leve for. Så vedkommende kan få mad på bordet, så vedkommende kan finde sted at bo. Men de penge, vi har brugt alligevel i forvejen. Når folk bliver arbejdsløse, så tvinger vi dem til en hel masse ting. I går, der var du hårdt arbejdende skattebetaler. Pludselig så bliver du arbejdsløs, så næste dag så er der en eller anden, der skal til at bestemme over dig. Der kommer stort set ikke nogen i arbejde. Det koster milliarder at kontrollere det og administrere det. Folk vil gerne arbejde. Når du sætter kontanthjælpen kraftigt ned, så kan du give endnu lavere løn. Hvis kontanthjælpen stiger, så kan lønnen stige tilsvarende uden at komme over kontanthjælpen. De arbejdsløse er faktisk berettiget til at, at, at findes uden at skulle søge jobs, som ikke er relevante for dem. Og det der til at blive tvunget til noget, man gerne vil. Jeg ved ikke, om du kender det. Når jeg, når jeg, når jeg prøver at, 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 at sige til mine børn, nu skal du gøre det der. Og de er jo lige ved at gøre det selv, så bliver det simpelthen så rasende. Der er ikke noget værre end, end, end at blive tvunget til noget, man gerne vil. Fordi så får man frataget ejerskabet og sit eget liv. Så når du dropper tvangen, så kan du tage de milliarder, du bruger til at administrere det. Mulighed for personlig udvikling. Ubetinget basisindkomst. Mulighed for at blive rask. Det bliver også kaldt borgerløn. Der er der rigtig mange, som gerne vil knokle for alle mulige ting, fordi det giver livet mening.
Thank <laughs> you. 